Before I move on to the next item of business, can I ask members and members of the public to leave the gallery quietly as we're on to a member's debate. It's a debate on motion 1183, the name of Jenny Gilruth, on mental health education. This will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Jenny Gilruth to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Ms Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to be speaking today in my first members' debate on mental health education in schools, an issue that I care passionately about. Exactly a week after I was elected, I was contacted by my constituent, Rachel, who is currently in S5 at Glenrothes High School. She wanted to know why teaching about mental health was not a compulsory part of the curriculum. She wanted to know why LGBTQ issues were not discussed openly in personal and social education lessons. She quoted GERFIC, the Scottish Government policy, which aims to support the well-being of our children and young people by offering the right help at the right time to the right people. Presiding officer, if the government is to close the attainment gap and drive aspiration and ambition in the next generation, then I believe, like Rachel, that it is imperative that schools get to grips with mental health education. We were all at school once, so we all think that we know about education. But whether you sat O grades or standard grades, national fives or sixth year studies, a commonality remains. To succeed academically, you need to be supported. But when 74% of young people don't know what mental health services are available in their area, it's clear that teachers, pupils and schools need support and direction from the government in terms of delivering that aspiration. I've noticed in recent weeks the government conflates the terminology of attainment and achievement. Presiding officer, you may have noticed these are different words. Attainment is a narrow measure of academic success. Achievement, however, is a far broader concept. It can be about your contribution to the whole school, about playing for your school football team, about applying yourself in class to the best of your abilities. Now, that's not something that you can necessarily measure with a test. But, presiding officer, I would argue that without our schools building in opportunities for our young people to achieve, you will never fully be able to close the attainment gap. Schools, after all, should not be an exams factory. To that end, I was delighted by the Cabinet Secretary's announcement last week that mandatory unit assessments for National 5 and higher, uh, higher will now be removed. Presiding officer, our schools have a key role to play in preparing our young people for life, in skilling them with resilience, with confidence and with the attributes they'll need to cope in an ever-changing economy. These are the fundamental principles of Curriculum for Excellence. But what's the picture for our young people in Scottish schools today? For girls, it's mixed. A recent EIS report entitled Getting It Right for Girls made for some pretty shocking reading. Casual misogyny was found to be commonplace. Terms like man up or uh, using girly in a derogatory fashion, for example. This type of behaviour impacts upon girls' mental health directly because it makes them feel unequal. Last month, the Chartered Management Institute report showed that the gender pay gap in Scotland was the worst in the UK. 29.2% and a difference in earnings of £11,000 between men and women. And, as Rachel stated, mental health education is of vital importance to pupils from the LGBT community. Indeed, a report by the Time for Education campaign found that 90% of LGBT pupils surveyed experienced homophobia, biphobia and transphobia whilst at school. 72% of those reported that same bullying was not challenged by teachers. And only 4% felt that the Scottish Government was doing enough to tackle it. It's clear that our schools need to do more to ensure that LGBT bullying is tackled head-on. Indeed, the associated link between this behaviour and poor mental health is evident. 42% of respondents who had been bullied because of uh, they or their LGBT label had attempted suicide once or more than once. Furthermore, a Stonewall Scotland report from 2014 highlighted that LGBT people were almost more than four times more likely than the general population to access mental health services. Presiding officer, if pupils across Scotland are not taught about mental health, whether that be anxiety, depression, bereavement or low confidence, how then can we say that they have been succeeded rather, in preparing the next generation for the challenges that the world is yet to throw in their way? I don't have time just now, thank you. As the Samaritans have highlighted, young people in Scotland have some of the highest rates of health and social inequality in Europe and North America. CPAG in Scotland no evidence that children in low-income households are nearly three times as likely to suffer from mental health problems than their more affluent peers. There is clearly a link between poverty and poor mental health. And we know that poverty presents in schools. Last year, an EIS survey recorded an increase in the number of pupils coming to school without any food. 
not even a play piece. Presiding officer, this government is seeking to close the attainment gap which exists between Scotland's poorest and wealthiest children. There must be a recognition, therefore, from the government that children growing up in poverty face greater challenges in attaining academically. Conversely, schools need to focus their efforts around social and emotional support, the type of support that will build resilience and confidence, thereby enabling pupils to succeed academically, but also to go on and to lead fulfilling lives, the type of support which will further seek to challenge discrimination and intolerance. In their submission to the Government on the Mental Health Strategy consultation, SAMH note that the 30% increase in the CAMS workforce between 2009 and 2016. Notwithstanding, they also note the increase in the waiting list for assessment and the numbers of young people being admitted for CAMS treatment. SAMH further points to the fact that not all health boards are meeting the access to treatment target. Presiding officer, I'm sure that the Minister will agree with me that waiting for mental health support such as CAMS is not acceptable. For young people, however, it can be devastating. SAMH are calling on the government to include the assessment of mental health education in the school's inspection regime, and I am absolutely supportive of them in this aspiration. Presiding officer, this time last year I was a teacher. Every morning I stood in front of my registration class for 15 minutes. This involves saying the school prayer, taking the register, reading the daily bulletin. It also involved listening to my pupils. For that reason, I have always found registration to be a fundamental part of the school day. And whilst it is now time for the government to reflect critically on how mental health education is delivered, there is also a role for individual schools, and particularly secondary schools, to reflect upon how they timetable that first point of contact on the school day between pupils and teaching staff. Now, I know that some local authorities have removed registration altogether, but from sexism to homophobia, and from any type of bullying to bereavement, registration in the school day is a crucial time in which pupils often come to teachers with their fears. I know from experience. Presiding officer, health and wellbeing is a core curriculum area under Curriculum for Excellence. There is a whole page of curriculum content devoted to mental, emotional, social and physical wellbeing. It's clear, however, that the government needs to provide greater, greater clarity to schools in developing a preventative approach to issues around mental health and to supporting resilience in the next generation. I understand that the government is currently reviewing its mental health strategy and I'm grateful that the minister will be providing a response today. Can I say to the Minister, however, that the strategy must contain a reference to the delivery of mental health education in our schools if it is to be truly effective. Young people need to know what good mental health means. They need to be taught about the importance of sport, for example, in developing positive mental health. They need to de uh, develop an understanding of how positive relationships with others can decrease depression and anxiety, for example. They need to be taught resilience within the safe space of the classroom, as Rachel explained to me in May of this year. So I hope that the government will listen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Open debate. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Graham Dave. Four minutes, Mr Cameron. <clears throat> thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Jenny Gilruth for marking this as Member's Business and for giving us the opportunity to talk about mental health education in the Chamber today. It's an area of health policy that has often been overlooked in the past, and I feel that now it is receiving the kind of attention it deserves. So I commend her for her persistence in pursuing this matter. Whilst there is a high degree of political consensus around mental health, we cannot let consensus breed complacency. Around a quarter of Scots suffer or have suffered from a mental health problem. That remains a staggering statistic. And given the, the stigma that still surrounds this issue, that figure may be higher still. I'd like to concentrate my brief remarks on the Scottish Youth Parliament's report on mental health, which notes that the figure of one in four Scots is mirrored with young people who have suffered or suffer from a mental health problem. And it is astonishing that half of all diagnosable mental health problems start before the age of 14 and three quarters by the age of 21. Now, I had the pleasure, uh, along with my colleague Miles Briggs, of meeting a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament last week. I was incredibly impressed with her passion to see change in the way we think and talk about mental health and the way we act upon it. Her message was, was loud and clear. It's a topic that is being raised in youth parliaments across the UK, and in their phraseology, is truly an epidemic amongst our young people. As Jenny Gilruth notes in her motion, it is extremely worrying that 70% of young people are unaware of what mental health services are available in their community. This isn't just down to a lack of information, but as the Scottish Youth Parliament's report notes, it's down to the subject of mental health just not being discussed enough 
in the classroom. That report says that discussing mental health is way down the list of priorities and that it's felt to be more important for you to get qualifications than to be healthy and happy at school. And with this in mind, it's no wonder that only a tenth, a tenth of young people feel that they would be comfortable talking to a teacher about their mental health. In my view, we need to act now so that young people feel confident and able to discuss mental health openly without fear of ridicule or recrimination. And I welcome the fact that the Scottish Government will be publishing their strategy for mental health later this year, which will hopefully provide a blueprint, a blueprint for addressing the mental health needs of Scots of all ages, but particularly young people. We cannot just let that gather, gather dust. Well-intentioned sentiments must be matched with action. Our party have pointed to a pledge for an additional £300 million to be invested in improving mental health treatment over the course of this Parliament. And we would like to see some of that go towards mental health education. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is clear from the Scottish Youth Parliament's report and others that we need to work harder to deliver better mental health support in education, but also to ensure that all young people in particular are aware of where to find such support. The emphasis on early intervention in the Scottish Government's consultation paper is welcome, but as the Scottish Youth, Youth Parliament has noted, more needs to be done in schools to ensure that mental health becomes an open topic rather than a closed book. Thank you very much. I call Graham Day to be followed by Monica Lennon. Mr Day, please. Uh, Presiding officer, let me begin by congratulating my colleague Jenny Goldruth for securing an opportunity to discuss this important issue. And can I apologise to you and the Chamber for having to leave before the debate is concluded. The Scottish Government put a uh, marker down in this area when it launched the Scottish Attainment Challenge in February 2015 and referenced delivery not just in relation to literacy and numeracy but health and well-being too, thereby joining the dots between the two. As Bernardo stated in their briefing for the debate, good mental health is integral to children and young people's ability to achieve and reach their full potential in education. And we know there can be a number of contributory factors to poor mental health amongst young people. I want to touch on a couple of these. Firstly, bullying. I'm mindful of the push currently to tackle LGBT bullying, which Jenny Goldruth highlighted. And we would all, of course, be supportive of that, presiding officer. But it is important that we don't focus on that particular type of bullying to the detriment of others. Bullying is bullying whether it concerns someone's sexuality, ethnicity or appearance. And it's unacceptable on so many levels, not the least of which is the mental harm and indeed legacy into adulthood that it can leave. And the second, one I must admit I had not recognised until reading Marie Curie's briefing for the debate, is the impact of bereavement. Any adult who has suffered the loss of a parent knows the impact, immediate and lingering, that can have. Imagine what it must be like for a youngster who doesn't have the emotional maturity that comes with adulthood and life experience. We're told that 2,500 parents die, leaving 4,100 bereaved children behind each year in Scotland. That research suggests there are more than 5,000 kids in our country who are significantly affected by bereavement and that 90% of those at Paul Mac Young Offenders Institution have suffered significant bereavement in the past. These are thought-provoking statistics that absolutely endorse the plans on the part of the Scottish Government to appoint a new national coordinator for childhood bereavement. So how do we set about better supporting young people in this area? There is quite clearly a need uh, for early identification of issues and for the creation of an environment within educational settings that increases knowledge and understanding around mental health gives youngsters ready access to information and support they might require in this area and the confidence to take advantage of that. We need to be able to head off a majority of issues long before CAMS referrals become necessary. But in developing such an approach, we must also, more than anything, listen to the views of young people themselves in order to understand what they feel they need and the form messaging might best take. Jenny Goldruth's motion notes the report by the Scottish Youth Parliament on this matter. I want to reference a comment from the report covering the lived experience of a youngster who, feeling isolated and alone, sought to self-diagnose online. Quote, the internet is a very scary place. It over-exaggerates and the scaremongering is extreme. I was feeling sad at the start of the year. I googled how I was feeling, and by the end, I was convinced I had paranoid schizophrenia. It was terrifying. Presiding officer, that co comment really hammers home the need to ensure troubled young people can easily access the right information and support. 
It was reported recently that more than 900 children in Scotland contacted Childline last year about suicide. That stat tells us we are currently coming sh up short in the area of children's mental health. But let me finish on a positive note by highlighting a small example of good practice being implemented in my constituency, indeed at the primary school my own children attended. Deaf children often suffer from lowest self-esteem and mental health issues as a result of feeling isolated, particularly if they're the only child in the school who's deaf. Carlogli Primary in Carnoustie has a hearing support ba ba uh, base for deaf pupils from across Angus. So in that setting, I guess, isolation is less of an issue. Nevertheless, the base offers a communal area where deaf pupils can meet each other in the morning and discuss their day with the teacher of the deaf before beginning class, an opportunity damagingly denied them in mainstream settings. This and the wider work done by the hearing support base is designed to develop confidence, positive self-esteem and ensure inclusion, thereby helping to address the mental health and well-being of the deaf pupils. This may sound like a relatively simple idea targeted at only a relatively small number of young people, but successfully tackling mental health issues amongst youngsters will involve small scale as well as large scale measures. And if we are to achieve this, we must ensure that no group is excluded, presiding officer. Thank you very much. I move now to Monica Lennon, followed by Miles Briggs. Ms Lennon, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to Jenny Gilruth for bringing this important motion to the Chamber. As Scottish Labour's inequality spokeswoman, I welcome the opportunity to debate the contribution that mental health education can make to closing the attainment gap. Jenny Gilruth rightly refers in her motion to the worrying statistics uh, collated by the Scottish Youth Parliament and others have mentioned today, which show that almost three quarters of young people who have experienced a mental health problem did not know what support was available in their local area. And I think we have to commend the Scottish Youth Parliament for their comprehensive research by enabling us to hear the voices of almost 1,500 young people from across Scotland. What was also concerning is that more than half of those young people in the survey said they wouldn't feel comfortable speaking to a teacher about their mental health. And that indicates there needs to be a cultural shift to, to deal with what the Scottish Youth Parliament are calling our generation's epidemic. I'm not sure if Donald Cameron was meaning Terry Smith, but I also had the pleasure of, of meeting Terry, recently the chair of the Scottish Youth Parliament. And she talked me through the vital work that they were carrying out to uncover the truth about young people and mental health. And I was also really moved by her own personal story about her own mental health recovery. And I feel that by Terry speaking so openly, that will certainly encourage others to, to do the same. What's clear from speaking to Terry and other young people is that they feel they're being failed by the system, the system which should be in place to support them. And it's putting young people at a disadvantage in the classroom. Jenny Gilder spoke about Mid-Scotland and Fife. In Central Scotland, the region that I serve, there are dozens and dozens of young people unable to access the mental health services that they need. And we've spoke about the, the CAMS targets, and, and I note that the, the Minister is in the Chamber today, and I look forward to getting an update on the efforts being made to address the, the waiting times. Because it's simply unacceptable that thousands of young people are being left languishing on waiting lists for more than four and a half months, which amounts to more than an entire school term. Jenny Gilruth also highlighted the, the link between uh, poverty and poor mental health. And just last week at First Minister's Question Time, I raised this also with Nicola Sturgeon. Um, the Scottish Health Survey shows there is a real postcode lottery and there is a, a, a link between deprivation and, and mental health that just isn't improving. The government has recognised there is much more work to be done and I hope that we see in the new mental health strategy uh, some commitment to take forward evidence-based targeted programmes to approve this, this dismal situation, this, this you know, stubborn link between deprivation and mental health. Because we know that the treatment of young people with mental health is just as important as problems with physical health. So we know there needs to be a step change in the way that schools approach attainment to ensure that good mental health is embedded in the curriculum. The Scottish Youth Parliament is in a strong position to make recommendations. It's suggesting that Education Scotland should develop a mental health standard for schools to bring mental health into sharp focus in classrooms. And Graeme Day mentioned Bernardo Scotland. They've come up with some really, really good ideas uh, in their response to the government's consultation, and I hope they'll be taken on board. 
They're telling us that they feel there's an, an overemphasis on the, the medical model approach and there should be more emphasis on the social model. The Time For Me um, project in Northern Ireland represents some really good practice and I hope that the Minister can take that on board when she's looking at the consultation responses. Wraparound support programmes do provide opportunities to promote positive mental and emotional health through discussion around relationships, working with others, sex, drugs, smoking, alcohol and other health related issues. For those pupils who are having difficulties or distress, schools also have the capacity to offer support through mentoring or school based counselling. That's a model we can all learn from and I would urge the Scottish Government to look at the work by Bernardo's in Northern Ireland as a new mental health strategy is being taken forward. Thank you. Thank you. I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Liam McArthur. Mr McArthur will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Briggs, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'd also like to congratulate Jenny Gilruth on securing today's debate, and I'm pleased to take part. I think it's also important to recognise the, the classroom experience which she's brought on this issue to the Chamber, and I hope these sorts of um, ideas are taken forward by the Minister. I think all of us will agree that mental health education is extremely important and, must, and we must work to, to deliver a better strategy in the future that meets the needs of our young people. Early access to information and support can be crucial in preventing mental health difficulties among our young children and ad adolescents, developing to, into more acute mental health conditions as they progress. The mental health awareness and information has a, has a vital part to play in making further progress to eliminate the stigma around mental health problems. Half of those with lifetime mental health problems first experience symptoms at the age of 14. Jenny Gilruth's motion re references the Scottish Youth Parliament's recently published report on mental health and mental health information, our generation's epidemic. And as Donald Cameron has also already mentioned, we both met with the Scottish Youth, Youth Parliament last week to discuss this report, um, which has been a really valuable and welcome, welcome contribution to this debate. As the motion suggests, it's very concerning that the vast majority of young people who took part in the Scottish, Scottish Youth Parliament's research did not know what mental health information, support and services were available in their local areas. One of the key recommendations of the, the report was that schools, colleges and universities should all provide high quality information about mental health. We believe that it is essential that this information is made available and that access is, both, is also user friendly. Where possible, pupils and students should be involved in the process so that they can have their input in real terms to the type of information they would like to receive and its design. Young people should be aware of what support is available for them in their local areas and that mental health and physical health are also looked at together. And for a generation used to getting most of their information from the internet now, it's also appropriate that young people are directed to safe online resources such as Young Minds and iMinds. iMinds is working with young people aged 13 to 21 to create and share a wide range of on online resources in a partnership between Glas Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS, SNOOC and the Mental Welfare Foundation. I believe social media also has a vital uh, role to play in this and companies such as Facebook and Twitter should also help play their role in providing this information. I hope that gives opportunities for existing geographical age specific advertising these companies offer and they, they could be encouraged to actually provide this for free as part of their social responsibility agenda. I've written to both Facebook and Twitter um, to raise this idea and I'm happy to share that with members across the chamber once I receive a response. We also believe that age appropriate information on local mental health support and services should be provided in GP surgeries, hospitals and other NHS settings. Informal peer-to-peer -peer support at youth groups, clubs and voluntary organisations that work with young people is also vitally important. The last mental health strategy committed to increasing local knowledge of social prescribing opportunities, low intensity treatments like self-help and peer support. But Sam H have also pointed out that the process in meeting that commitment has actually been very slow. Such good work is being done in the voluntary sector um, to offer mental health education and support to our young people already. And I'd wish to commend Place to Be, which is working with primary schools in some of Edinburgh's most disadvantaged communities to offer therapeutic and emotional support to pupils and their families. To conclude, presiding officer, 
Today's debate is timely, and I hope that this will help inform ministers as they prepare the new mental health strategy and, and encourage them to ensure mental health education is an integral part of that strategy when it's brought forward. Thank you, Mr Briggs. I call Liam MacArthur. Mr MacArthur, four minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Can I join with others in congratulating Jenny Gilruth, not just on securing the debate, but I think in setting the scene uh, very well indeed. Uh, can I also thank the Scottish Youth Parliament for their work in this area? I think Speak Your Mind is a thorough report. It articulates very well the nature of the problems faced and what gives rise to them. But uh, I think, as importantly, it goes on to set out a, a number of rec recommendations in, re in relation to information, support and services, all of which I think are very practical, uh, practical and deliverable. Uh, could I pay particular tribute to Orkney's two MSYPs, uh, Jack Nurkwoy and Thorfinn Moffat, uh, for their actions in, in promoting the report locally in Orkney, but also, I think, effectively articulating the specific islands dimension to this, whether in terms of the availability of services, the risk of isolation, whatever. I think young people living in, uh, in an island setting do face specific challenges uh, that perhaps others uh, don't have to, to face. Before addressing the uh, specifics of the report and today's uh, motion, I want to make a couple of general observations in relation to, to mental health. I still feel that it's not been taken seriously, seriously enough, and that, do, that does shame us all. It affects uh, around one in three people uh, in this country during the course of their life, and we're still not open or honest enough uh, about it. The impacts uh, can be shattering on individuals, on family and friends, and on uh, wider communities, and ultimately, there is no good health without good uh, mental health. Uh, that's why I believe that mental health needs to have parity in law uh, with the treatment of physical health. I think, if nothing else, that helps drive uh, budgetary decisions. And the ongoing lack of a mental health strategy is more than regrettable. I, mean, I realise that it's in the offing, but the fact that no, I, I don't have time, and you can address it in your wind-up, but simply not acceptable that it's been allowed to lapse. Now, I very much welcome Maureen Watt's uh, uh, appointment to the specific role, but I do feel uh, this needs uh, to lead to the government uh, upping its game. As I outlined earlier, the damaging impact of poor mental health uh, is, is widespread and well uh, recognised, but particularly so uh, for young people, not least in terms of shaping their life chances, and I think this is illustrated uh, perfectly well in the findings of this report. It can affect uh, attainment, as Jenny Gilruth's uh, motion rightly points out, damaging relationships and attachment, undermining self-confidence and self-esteem, and can exacerbate uh, inequalities of health, although I think it's important to uh, remember that this does affect those from all backgrounds in all parts of the country and is utterly indiscriminate in that respect. The Speak Your Mind report also paints, I think, an unsettling picture of patchy availability and awareness of services. Now, we put on record my gratitude to all those providing vital services in the, this area nationally as well as uh, locally in my Orkney constituency, the local mental health team, third sector organisations like Samaritans, the Blyde Trust, counselling services, and I declare an interest as a patron of OACAS. I look forward to taking part in a panel discussion at the Orkney Youth Cafe next month uh, with a number of them, but I think all of them uh, would contend that they are under enormous strains, that gaps exist, delays are happening, and young people are suffering as a consequence. I thought it was a point made very, very powerfully by Jenny Ruth in her uh, opening uh, speech. SYP's uh, recommendations, as I say, I think are practical and, and, and maybe chart a way uh, of delivering improvements, whether in terms of a mental health standard for schools, uh, availability of good information for children and, and young people in our schools, and an action plan to promote good mental health. And I think this needs to form part of a wider effort, of course, uh, but absolutely needs to be picked up in the government's overall strategy uh, when it is finally produced. So can I thank uh, Jenny Ogilruth again for making this debate possible, and I thank Scottish Youth Parliament for their invaluable contribution on shining a light on an issue that still too often remains shrouded in stigma, ignorance, and complacency. It's long past time that as a country, we speak our mind and speak our mind clearly when it comes to the critical importance of good mental health. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I now call Maureen Watt to wind up the government. Minister, seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I too thank Jenny Gilruth very much for bringing forward this motion. And I'm very pleased to respond to this debate on behalf of the Scottish Government. I, should, I would like, however, to start by saying that Liam MacArthur has got it completely wrong. We do and have had a mental health strategy. It's only that we're going to update it and take it forward for the next 10 years.
that I have been working on since I was appointed to this post. And I think that those who work in the field of mental health and all the young people who have contributed through their various organisations realise that the government, because of my position, are taking this issue very seriously and it has been well received uh, through uh, the many organisations that I've met. The importance of mental well-being is recognised in raising attainment and closing the gap and is a focus of many of the authorities and schools involved with the Scottish Attainment Challenge. Using nurturing and restorative practices approaches helps create positive environments to encourage marginalised children and young people to learn, thrive and feel engaged. Health and wellbeing is one of the eight curricular areas in Curriculum for Excellence. Its substantial importance is reflected in the, its position at the centre of the curriculum and at the heart of children's learning, as well as a central focus of the Scottish Attainment Challenge and the National Improvement Framework for Education. Along with literacy and numeracy, health and wellbeing is one of the three core areas that is the responsibility of all staff in the school. Children and young people should feel happy, safe, respected and included in the learning environment and all staff should be pro proactive in promoting positive relationships and behaviour in the classroom, playground and wider learning community. And Jenny Goruth specifically mentioned the position of LGBT children and we are providing as a government 75,000 to LGBT Youth Scotland to underpin delivery of youth work to young LGBT people including supporting their positive mental health and the DF the, De the Deputy First Minister recently met LGBT Youth Scotland uh, and to discuss what can be done to support uh, those with LGBT LGBT issues. So the Scottish Government recognises the importance of nurturing approaches in addressing and overcoming the barriers that some children experience in school. This is addresses many of the concerns around equity outlined within the Scottish Attainment Challenge. Education Scotland has developed a national resource to support the development and practice of nurturing approaches for secondary schools. This will help provide equal opportunities for all children and young people to learn and develop. And I think Monica Lennon and Miles Briggs made good points when they said that um, people are not, are not aware of what is available. And it, people have heard of CAMS, but as many um, members who contributed mentioned, people might not necessarily need to wait for CAMS. And I am dealing with the waiting times, which is a separate issue, but they may require lower tier intervention and children's input is vital in that. But there are a lot of third sector organisations involved in that. Ms Lennon. On that point, does, does the Minister uh, accept that having councillors based in schools might be part of the solution rather than young people have to wait? Uh, to go to the, the CAMS referral system, having that support in school might just be a, a better approach. Minister. Absolutely, and that is already happening in many schools. For example, uh, we're providing £90,000 for Place to Be, a charity providing school based mental health services. And this involves one-to-one -one counselling and group therapy, which is delivered, I think Miles mentioned it, in Edinburgh, uh, it's in Glasgow, and it's expanding uh, to North Ayrshire, and that deals with a wide range of social issues which might be affecting children's mental health. So, as well as Education Scotland developing the, nat the national resource, uh, they are currently developing a national resource to support the de development and practice of nurturing approaches to, for primary schools. The whole school nurturing approach can, provide, can promote school co connectedness, resilience and the development of social and emotional competences, all of which are key aspects of promoting mental well-being. So if we take Jenny Gilruth's own patch, currently in five, six primary schools and three secondary schools are receiving support through the Scottish Attainment Challenge Schools Programme, with over 450,000 allocated to the primary schools in 2016-17. The funding is supporting improvements in health and wellbeing across the schools, with a focus on supporting wellbeing through the recruitment of educational psychologists 
and family support workers. And I'd like to highlight one example, St Kenneth's Primary School in Loch Gelly, which is funding a drugs, alcohol and psychotherapy worker to work with children and families to talk through concerns and worries about nurture, counselling and coaching support with the aim of reducing or negating social and emotional barriers to learning. I very much welcome, as other members have done, the Scottish Youth Parliament's latest research, Our Generation's Ec Epidemic, Young People's Awareness and Experience of Mental Health Information Support and Services. This research has been undertaken as part of the SYP's Speak Your Mind campaign on mental health. I too met with the Scottish Youth Parliament on the 21st of September and I congratulate them on their fascinating and well-written document. I listened and took note of their recommendations that are for specifically for the Scottish Government and will consider these as part of our public engagement on the new mental health strategy. During that public engagement, we've worked co closely with the Scottish uh, Youth Parliament uh, to ensure that young people have had their opportunity to contribute their views on matters that affect them. I've also met uh, with the Church of Scotland's Youth Assembly one Sunday. I've met with uh, Young Scott uh, and the Coalition of Children's Services, all to help me decide how to take forward this strategy. And it's all part of our improvement agenda, which has driven forward, which we've driven forward over the last few years through the delivery of our national mental health and suicide prevention strategies. I expect that the new strategy to focus, uh, will focus on encouraging development of new models of managing mental health problems in primary care. And I anticipate a very strong focus on early intervention and prevention, as you, Donald Cameron, uh, mentioned. And it certainly won't be gathering dust under my watch. As soon as it is published, I will be taking it <coughs> forward and driving it forward as long as I'm in this post. So um, there will be also, though I think we need to have a focus on developing and, uh, and measuring outcomes for um, mental health work. And part of the significant 150 million additional investment the Scottish Government recently announced on improving mental health and well-being will directly contribute to that aim. The First Minister announced in January that part of that funding, 54.1 million, will go towards directly improving access to mental health services for adults and children. And in February, we also announced a mental health primary care fund as part of our 10 million commitment to mental health primary care services and the wider transformation of primary care. Boards are working with partners and they can submit proposals for innovative approaches to mental health support in primary care. And this provides a real opportunity, I think, to think differently about how services are organised. So, presiding officer, I'm looking forward to this channel, challenge. It is a channel challenge, uh, and I look forward to working with members to deliver our ambition. Thank you. That concludes the debate. I suspend this meeting till 2.30.